Dan Borvin, good to have you back. Hey, good to be here. Program. Just had a good recording of uh, dealing with the three marks of a true and faithful church. We thought to be a little more, it was practical, but we'll be pretty practical in this one. And talk about vocation and stations in life and contentment, anxieties, um, these sort of things that people face in light of the different challenges and providences of God that are that are difficult. You know, I think we all deal with and, and struggle with uh, the issue of contentment in the callings God has for us. And, um, you know, we're always trying to fix and change things. <laughs> I was thinking, I think we talked last time, it was with you, I can't remember, about Paul's thorn in the flesh. Yeah, yeah. You know, here he's given this thorn in the flesh. We're not ever told what it was, right? Right. I've often thought that's just brilliant of our Lord to not tell us. Because yeah. if we, he was specific, we wouldn't even apply yeah. it. That's not my know? problem. Yeah, it's not my that's problem. That's Paul's problem. But that thorn was something that really aggravated him. Could have been physical, spiritual, um, variety of things all across the spectrum, you know. And he begins by praying that the Lord would take it away. The Lord didn't do that. My grace is sufficient. And then Paul, Paul had to learn some things through that. But that's difficult for people. Um, it's difficult, you know, when you're facing anxieties over the difficult callings in life and the constant pressure to want to change circumstances, which God doesn't always let us do right. or promise that he will. Yeah. But we can make matters worse. <laughs> we can make matters worse by uh, by disobeying His will, which is the clearly revealed will, and uh, choosing paths that you know um, to change our circumstances that He hasn't changed. Yeah, and that discontentment can lead to any number of bad decisions in life. Yeah, and it's difficult. You know, there's there is no black and white, clear path right. always. Right. If we think of our vocations as in our employment or even in our vocations as husbands, as wives, as as fathers and mothers and things, it takes wisdom and it's not always clear, but we can get ourselves into heaps of trouble by being yeah. discontent yeah. and making rash decisions that are selfish, even if we think we're not being selfish mm -hmm. in the moment. Yeah. And I'm thinking of a guy I knew when I was in graduate school in England. This guy was in his mid-50s, lived in Oregon, had four kids, had a decent job. I can't remember what he was doing put food on the table for his family, provided for his family. He decided in his mid fifties that he should go get a PhD in Oxford, England, moved his family there, had teenage kids, went into hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. <laughs> wow. Yeah. To pursue his dream yeah. of a PhD in history. Yeah. Now, first of all, it's a bad move for many reasons. <laughs> but if, if you're going to go get a PhD, don't get a PhD in history. Yeah. Where, where's the upside? Yeah. You're going to go maybe get a job, maybe get a job at a university, and yeah. you're not going to make a whole lot of money. <laughs> now, if you go get a PhD in computer science and go work for Google, all right, well, maybe there's an upside. But the sacrifice his family had to make yeah. for this... Poor wife. His poor wife, his <laughs> poor teenage kids left their friends wow. behind, their schools behind, yeah. moved to another country, yeah. another continent. Yeah. So he could pursue his dream. Yeah. yeah. So foolish. Yeah. Uh, much of the anxieties, let's talk about anxiety for a minute. Much of the anxiety, I mean, people, I, I was preaching on Paul statement, you know, famous one everyone loves. Um, let your gentleness be... Uh, made known to all men, the Lord is at hand, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, I was preaching on this one time and a girl came up to me and said, you're not going to just tell us now we can never be anxious. And if we have any anxiousness, it's all sin. What she was struggling with, she had real physiological issues that she needed help with. And that's not 
what we're talking about no. here. A lot of the anxiousness that scripture that scripture's dealing with are anxieties that we bring on ourselves. Right. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think when Paul wrote that, he was directly tying into Luke um, when Jesus talked about not being anxious and worrying about your life. Yeah. Worrying about what you'll put on, worrying about what you'll eat, worrying about your future. He says, listen, you know, I feed the birds of the air. I'm going to take care of you. That's where most of our anxieties come. Yes. But anxieties come because we're trying to, number one, we're discontent right. often. And I think that's why Paul moves to contentment right after this. And where's Paul writing from? <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. in prison. Jail. <laughs> he's in prison. Right. Who, who has a right to be more discontent than Paul? And yet he's telling us, don't be anxious. Don't be discontent. Whatever state I yeah. am to be content. And, the state and, I'm in right now is prison. <laughs> listen, and prison back then wasn't as good oh as prison goodness. in America. Roman prison? Forget it. <laughs> I know. This isn't club fed. Right. Like Martha Stewart went to. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, they, they didn't even get meals. Right. People had to bring yes. their food to them. You had to be cared for by outsiders. Yeah. Or, or you would you, starve to you'd death. starve to death. Yes. In the hole. In the You're hole. You're in a hole getting fed by outsiders. Yeah. And Paul says, be content. Amazing. Yeah. And it, it does kind of bring things into perspective in light of often, you know, our anxieties and things that we face. But what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is some, a lot of, a lot of the anxieties we face is because we're discontent with the circumstances that we're in. And, um, and, and Paul had a perspective that everything, even our marriages, you know, what God has joined together, <laughs> he view marriage as God put you with this person. You know, we tend to think I'm so autonomous. I have figured out the love of my life. And, you know, my this, soulmate. Is, this is the soulmate. This is the one. And uh, God has a little different perspective. He finds a wife, finds a good thing, and obtains favor from the Lord. Um, every circumstance is so governed by him uh, in his sovereignty. I mean, what do we say in the Heidelberg? Not a hair falls from our head without the will of our Father in heaven. Now, some people have lost a lot of hair and they might not quite <laughs> like that, you know, but the point is, is he's even that much in control of the hairs of our head. Yeah. So we find ourselves often with anxieties due to circumstantial things. And like you said, it's when, and, and Paul gives a good course forward here, um, path forward. It's like you said, when we begin to think autonomously and how do most people think about, you know, I think it was in the Truman book, right? How did people look at work years ago? Yeah. People looked at work as, you know, the, the question I think he was just talking about with his grandfather, father, I can't remember, but it was, you know, do, do you, do you like your job? Yeah. What do you, what do you mean? Yeah. It's, Who cares? It's my job. Yeah. <laughs> this is how I provide for my family. Yeah. Um, First of is, all, you didn't choose your job. <laughs> yeah, so if you go back prior to the yeah. modern era, right. you didn't get to pick your job. Right. What do you do? You do what your father did. Yeah, exactly. Your father's a barrel maker. You're a barrel maker. Mm -hmm. You don't get to go off and chase your dream of being a cobbler. Yeah. You do what your father did. Right. And yes, your, your job is not for personal fulfillment. Right. This is one of the most egregious aspects of our culture today yeah. because we're so consumer driven. Yeah. We think we're carving out our destiny. Yes. According to our image, what we want, what we like. Our identity, our personal fulfillment is found in our occupation. We've been taught this everywhere. Absolutely. From the cars you pick, we got a hundred choices, the colors. All society taught teaches us to think like this, but the scriptures don't. Right. Yeah. So yeah, t talk to an auto worker on Henry Ford's assembly line in 1910 <laughs> and say, do you find personal fulfillment in your job? He would laugh in your face. Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. What would he say? This feeds my family. Yeah. I work to provide for my family. That's yeah. it. I'm in he, the coal mines. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sucking up the soot. But you know what? My family has food. Yes. That's my purpose. Yes. Go tell a Welsh coal miner who spends 12 hours underground a day, <laughs> who gets black lungs, dies in yeah. his 50s, yeah. that he can't, he should find personal fulfillment somewhere else. No, he provides for his family and he's thankful that he has a job to provide for his family. He's not looking for personal fulfillment in that vocation. He finds that from God. You know, this was, this was really exposed in the, did you see the Walsh film on what is a, uh, Oh, what, what is, is a woman? woman? No, I haven't he, seen the whole thing He yet. goes to Africa. Yeah. And he asks this sort of American question to this African lady in a village. 
are you fulfilled? Are you happy? <laughs> she looked at him, what are you, are yeah. you crazy? Yeah. I'm bearing children. Of course I'm right. fulfilled. Yes. <laughs> you know, this is what I'm created to do. Right. Like, and she's, th these are not people, you know, these are not modern people. Right. Th these are people who are really, we would view as stuck in a previous age who don't even have a lot of knowledge of the scriptures and, and, you know, literature and she's fulfilled. Yes. Doing what she was made to do. So they have more wisdom from natural law. Natural law. That's what I was saying. Yes. Than we have in the West. Right. Who have rejected natural law and mm -hmm. deceived ourselves. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So this, this issue of anxiety is important to always define and think about. Again, you could have real issues that cause physical issues that cause anxiety that you need help with. Right. But we also have to be honest with ourselves that what often is causing us anxiety that leads, the, the bad decisions that we make are driven by anxieties that ultimately, and, and I realize it can be simplistic to say, just trust the Lord, just trust the Lord. I know that's, I know that can be, but that's still the call of scripture right. everywhere. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. So we can make a lot of ruin of our circumstances because of these anxieties without first Doing what Paul says here and looking to the Lord and asking for guidance and help, think of the thorn in the flesh where he had a, you know, perspective change. But he says here, you know, and everything by prayer, <laughs> there's almost a doxological kind of word there, you mm. know, worshiping and supplication with thanksgiving. Yeah. You know, we have a lot to be thankful for, you know, in life. You could complain about your spouse. You could complain about your children. You could complain about this and that. Most of our complaining is pretty narcissistically yep. driven. Yep. You know? Yeah. No, and that's a great cause of anxiety is our lack of gratitude. Mm -hmm. I deserve more right. than this. Why can't I get more than this? What rash decision do I have to make to get more yeah. than what I currently have? Because I'm not grateful for what I do have. Yeah. And then, you know, we talked about this before, but because of modern convenience and because of the time in which we live where, you know, we haven't really faced persecution and hardship, you know, it's made us softer people. Right. You know, what the, the immediate sort of response to any type of testing or affliction is then we shake our fist at God. I'm mad at you, God. You're what? You're mad at God? I mean, that's just a, that's a really terrible approach yeah. to the God of your life, to be mad at him when he's told you this life is full of suffering, affliction, hardship, and that glory's coming. Yes. But we're not there yet. Right. And we have to live under this crucible in these difficult, in the, in the vocations and the callings that God gives us to fulfill them because there's a greater purpose than me in it. Yeah. That's why I love the Heidelberg that talks about we go through the veil of tears. Right. That's what this life is. Mm -hmm. But because we have it so easy yeah. in the West, we think that we shouldn't even have to stub our toe. Right. Let alone suffer persecution, martyrdom, mm -hmm. which has been the, the majority of the history of the church. Right. Has been persecution and still right. is today around the right. world. Right. More right. Christians are martyred today than ever before. Right. But we've lived in this bubble wrap in the Western world. And so we complain yeah. <laughs> when we have bad cell reception. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. When our brothers and sisters of Christ are being martyred yeah. around the world. And, and that causes us great discontentment. Yeah. And so we need a perspective change. It is a perspective change. Yeah. I think that's what he says here. I think that's his whole point. He says, you know, be anxious for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication with Thanksgiving. So you've taken this to the Lord you have anxieties. Nobody denies that we have anxieties. We're going to struggle with anxieties. The Lord calls us to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. And he says, let your request be made known to God. The request is not a selfish request. The request is not, Lord, get me out of the situation. Um, it could be your spouse, you know, difficulty with that. Um, what does he say? When we come to him that way, prayerfully in thanksgiving, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The pr there's a promise there. I mean, that's always notice the promises of Scripture. The promise is not, pray to me and I'll fix everything. Yeah. You know, the promise is, 
peace will guard the heart and the mind. And that leads him to this perspective of, okay, well then in whatever situation I'm in, I've learned this mystery of contentment. Right. Yeah. He's not going to make all your problems go away, but he's going to provide you peace in the midst of the problem. Right. He'll be there with you Mm -hmm. in the midst of the problem. To strengthen you. Right. And so we can't just try to escape. Right. You know, if we think about our forefathers of the faith, when they were persecuted, in some cases it was prudent for them to leave, Mm -hmm. to come to North America, for example. Right. In other cases it wasn't. And so they endured even to the end. And so if we find ourselves in much less dire circumstances, Mm -hmm. we have a bad marriage, we have a job that is not the Hollywood version of peace and contentment that we would like it to be. Mm -hmm. We can't just cut and run. Even if we're trying to be faithful to God in the midst of these unpleasant circumstances, maybe this is God's will that he used these unpleasant circumstances to shape us, to conform us more into the image of his son. Right. Right. And he will provide peace in the midst of these unpleasant circumstances. And so even if we're in a bad marriage, we're in a a difficult financial situation, whatever, we can trust if we remain faithful to God, as Paul says, making our requests known to him, praying that he will give us contentment, Mm -hmm. that he will give us peace, that he'll take away our anxiety. We can trust that he'll be with us in the midst of that unpleasant circumstance, even if he doesn't make it go away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and providence, again, we talked about last time, but think of Joseph in the pit. Couldn't yeah. see the picture. Couldn't see the big picture. And uh, soon he would be raised up over as second in you know, right. command in Egypt. So the point is, is that was an awful thing to go through. But, you know, it's the same thing Paul's describing. And I, I you know, I, I don't find this to be easy by any means. Of course not. Um, but, you know, not that I speak in regard to need, <laughs> for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content, I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And here's the verse that, you know, usually is used for the soccer goal. But right. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> the context of that is he can actually provide the strength for you to look at every single circumstance of life and be content whether you're hungry or whether you're full. And and don't miss this point. It doesn't mean that being full is so easy either. Right. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean when you have everything that you're now okay. Right. Actually, that can be some of your most spiritually, you know, difficult times in your walk with Christ. Because it's like, you know, one, one old writer used to say some of, God's worst enemies are his good gifts because we take them and worship them. Yeah. You know? So point is, is, you know, it's, it's, it's when, it's when we're walking through the valleys that we, we don't walk around it. We walk through it and learn, learn to trust and learn these things that prepare us to say, no matter the circumstance, you know, I can learn to trust and be content. Yeah. And Whatever he's enough. He's enough. And that's the thing. We're not looking for these things to provide satisfaction, meaning, contentment. That's when we lose course, when we're looking for fulfillment in those things instead of fulfillment in Christ. Even good things. Yeah. Even good things like our family, like our vocation, Mm -hmm. our, our, our occupation. Good things, we don't look for them, look to them to provide that ultimate meaning, that contentment, that satisfaction. We look to Christ. Right. So when those things are not providing that satisfaction, we're not let down. Right. We're not discontent because we don't need it from those things. Mm-hmm. And even if our life is as miserable as can be in this present evil age, nothing but the veil of tears. Right. We never see the mountain. Right. Job times 10. Yeah. We still have the hope in heaven. Yeah. We're not looking for a home in this world, we need to be like Abraham looking for a home whose builder and maker is God. Yeah, right. So we shouldn't be content in this life in temporal things. Right. 
We shouldn't find, we shouldn't seek contentment in those things. We shouldn't be discontent when we don't find contentment in those things. Our ultimate contentment is always in Christ in the age to come. And, you know, this gets back to Truman's modern self. You know, everything was about personal happiness. Everything was about the pursuit of happiness. You know, that that's, you know, think, think of, you know, what we, what we've codified, you know, the pursuit of happiness is one of the great American goals. Right. So, you know, we've been all taught that's the pursuit. The problem is, is when that pursuit is outside of the goodwill of God, you're not pursuing happiness. You're pursuing misery. Right. And, and that's essentially, you know, what LGBT plus Q movement, all these movements have been to try to find in the modern self happiness. Um, because in some way we're discontent with the way God made us, or we're discontent with our circumstance, or we're discontent with this or that. So we're finding solutions outside of God's word. But I love what you said, purpose. This gets back to purpose. You know, some of the most fundamental truths of the Christian faith gets back to Westminster One. Yes. You know, what is the purpose for which you exist? Why do you, why are you here? It is, you know, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. He's enough, like you've been saying. Yeah. And so when we have Christ and we're glorifying God, we're fulfilled. That doesn't mean it's easy street, no. but it means that we are in a place of God's utmost care and will, and that's the best place to be. Yeah. And all those other things serve that ultimate purpose. Right. My family situation, my occupation, friendships, whatever, all the things in our lives are for that ultimate purpose of glorifying God. And so we're not distracted from our purpose when we see those things in their proper place. They fulfill, they, they help us to fulfill that ultimate purpose of glorifying God. Yeah. There's a lady that's been coming to the church and she has, uh, I think it's MLS and she can barely move anymore. And she sometimes shows up to the gym and she just barely gets around on her scooter and gets up on the, 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 the stair or the, um, not Stairmaster, but the, uh, um, what's treadmill? the other? treadmill? Good grief. It's getting long. Um, the treadmill and it's such a task and it takes 20 minutes just to get up on it. And she walks for, tries to walk for 10 and gets back down. And I walk up to her the other day. She's a believer. She comes to church when she can, when she can get here, does all she can to get here. And I say to her, I said, you know, you are an encouragement to me in your faith through your struggle. She goes, I am. She says, I don't see it at all. I'm, wow. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm a complainer and this and that. And I don't, I don't see that of course, but it's perspective, right? It's perspective. This woman, this woman has so trusted the Lord that she's committed and believes this is God's will for her. If he sustains her great, if he takes her great, she's learned to be content in that. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And she's probably grateful for those 10 minutes. Yeah. That she gets Just on, the, on treadmill. the treadmill. Those 10 minutes. And if she can make it to church in the evening, because she has to come in the evening because she, you know, doesn't feel good in the mornings. <laughs> you know, when you have everything and you're strong and you're, right. <laughs> you know, we make all the excuses under the sun. Find a million all. reasons <laughs> not to. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think it's the right kind of perspective that, that we we have to have. And, um, and to remember that, you know, with the doctrine of providence, there is fruitful years, lean years, health, sickness, prosperity, poverty, all things, in fact, come to us, not by chance, but from his fatherly hand. We have to believe that and trust yes. that. This, things, things are not just willy-nilly happening to us or disconnected from the will of God. This is, this is God's in his providential hand for us so that we might learn to trust him and glorify him. Yeah. Some people are Jeremiah yeah. and preach for many years and see little fruit. Yeah. Some people are called to lives of suffering yeah. in God's providential hand. So we shouldn't be discontent when a little bit of suffering comes our way. Right. And we should look to people like that lady yeah. as inspiration and encouragement that, yeah. what do I have to complain about? Exactly. Exactly. Keep that in front of you and then think of Christ on the cross for you and the suffering, the torments of hell so that he could give you the eternal promise of happiness and glory with him forever. Um, We lack no good thing. Yeah. So that's what we have to keep in front of us. Well, thanks. We'll come back next time. Thanks, Dan, for being on the program. Thanks. 